Good evening. Thank you for tuning in to Face to Face. I'm your host, Dennis Ward. Our guest this week is Rhonda Head, a classical singer from the Opasquiat Cree Nation in northern Manitoba. The mezzo-soprano has released three albums, has won awards, and played on one of the world's biggest stages. Rhonda has also survived two brain tumors and come back to perform. She's constantly giving back to her community of OCN and the Indigenous community at large, playing fundraisers and other events. Rhonda, thanks so much for joining us here this week on Face to Face. Uh, maybe a little on um, when you first discovered, at, at what age did you first discover that you had this uh, amazing voice? I was actually uh, older in life. I was 18 years old when, uh, when I discovered I had a voice. But I was always involved in music when I was probably eight years old till about 14. I studied piano and theory and went up to grade five. And uh, when I went to school, and in, in, uh, after I graduated grade 12 from here in Winnipeg, I went to school in Toronto where I didn't know a soul. And I decided to um, try something different because I was in a city that, that had so many opportunities to, to try. And, and uh, I was either going to go into acting, dancing, or, or voice. So I decided, um, because I had the ma already had the musical background, I decided to go into voice. And when I looked in, into the phone book at that time, <laughs> remember when we had phone books? <laughs> 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 there was about this much of music teachers on, on, in the phone book, and I thought, wow, how am I going to choose a teacher? So I went into the middle of that, in, that inch, and, and I just, and then I looked, and that's who I called. And the person that I called happened to live in my neighborhood in Toronto. And anyone that's been to Toronto knows it's, the, it's uh, like a metropolis. It's a huge, huge city. So this teacher that I found, he, he lived in the neighborhood where, where I lived in Toronto. And I, I called him up. I called him up to make arrangements for lessons. And, uh, and th the time came for my lesson. And I went to knock on his door. And this beautiful man opened the door. He, he looked like Warren Beatty. And, 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 uh, um, and he happened to sing opera. And I was so open and to try something new. So I thought, well, why not, why not give it a shot? And, and it happened that I had a, a voice for it. <laughs> so you weren't somebody who grew up uh, singing in the shower in no. the car thinking, oh, I got a no. great voice. No, not at all. <laughs> I discovered it when I started taking voice lessons. And I often tell people that, that uh, the classical music <coughs> found me. I didn't go looking for it. So it was, it was kind of meant to be uh, in my path. So you didn't grow up uh, interested in opera or classical music either? I didn't grow up grow, uh, interested in opera, but, I, ha but I, w I did have a classical music background in, in the, the piano pieces that I played. So that, that interested me in, into that style of genre. But because I was open to it as well, I was, I was uh, you know, willing to try anything. So 18 years old, by the time you discover your voice, what uh, was that first public performance like for you? I didn't. I didn't perform in public right away because uh, the, when I started performing in public, it was 2001. When I went to school in Toronto, it was eight, 1987. So all that time, I was I was taking voice lessons and uh, studying voice, but I didn't feel confident to share my voice with anyone at, at that point in my life because of uh, you know we, we grew up with uh, uh, it being impacted by residential school and. And our confidence is, is, is not as, uh, it wasn't as high for me when I was 18 years old. So all that time I, I studied music and, and, and uh, um, took lessons and, and, and te learned technique to, to make my voice better. And, uh, and you know, I, I got sick with, with brain tumors, so I took a year off when I, when I did get sick. And then uh, uh, in 2001, I, I sang O Canada and Cree at the Opaskarak Cree Nation Blizzard hockey game. So that was the first time I shared my voice in, in public. And a lot of people approached me and, and, you know, they complimented my singing. And so I started gaining my confidence at that, at that point and I started, began to share my voice with the public. What did it take for you to, to boost that confidence to get out there and, and go back to your home community, all these people that you know and sing publicly in front of them all? It's, uh, you just got to do it. That's what, I, that's what I tell uh, when people ask me when, when they're get, getting into singing. Just go and do it. 
because you, you, the more you go out and sing in public, the, the less you're, 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 uh, you're less nervous. You're still nervous, but you, when, you, when you get that experience on stage, you learn how to control that ner the nerves. Has it uh, ever gotten any easier for you all these uh, many years later? Mm, I, I still get nervous. Uh, there, there's a, um, when I'm getting ready for a performance, I always jump around and shake off my nerves. That helps me a lot. And it's still nerve wracking when, when I go out there and, and perform in, in front of a crowd. You also uh, perform and have released a CD in Cree. How important is it for you to uh, have done that? My latest CD, um, it, it's really, I'm really proud of it because uh, a couple of the, the songs that in there I wrote and composed myself. Um, I, I, a couple of the songs are, are in the Cree language. And uh, you know, when, you're, when you sing in your language, in an indigenous language, there's a spirit that, that's, that goes along with this, the, the song. And it's really, it's really quite magical and extraordinary when, when the, the pieces that you sing in your language is delivered to the audience and, and there's just a connection with your audience. And it, it's, I think it's magical. It's really great to sing in, in uh, an indigenous language. Do you know other uh, opera singers, classical singers, who have done this, uh, released albums in an indigenous language? I believe there's, there's other, other uh, um, musicians, uh, artists that have sung in, in their, in their uh, indigenous language. In the, in the United States, I know there's Barbara McAllister. She's a dramatic mezzo-soprano who I, who I um, I go and see her a couple of times, or once in a while. She, men I'm, she's, I, she mentors me, so she's a really amazing opera singer who sang and and uh, she sang around the wor around the world. So there's other singers. Rhonda, you've uh, encountered some some health obstacles, as you mentioned, uh, some brain tumors. What uh, type of impact did that have on your career? Um, well, well, I took a year off. Like I took time off. Uh, my main focus when I got sick was to was to focus on my health and and to to come out of it healthier well, to come out of it and to survive that was my main focus so I just totally put everything away work and and music I just put it on the shelf and then I focused on my on my health and getting better and this happened a second time as well and it happened happened a second time uh, five years later my tumor grew back and uh, um, it was more devastating than the first time because I knew that I had to go face again. And uh, I told myself I didn't want to go through that surgery again because it, it, hurt. it, it hurts really a lot. <laughs> and uh, so I did some studying online and, and found out there was other treatment options that were uh, unevasive. And uh, the treatment that I found is at that time it wasn't, it wasn't offered in Canada. It was offered everywhere else around the world but Canada, and uh, I chose <coughs> I chose the one in um, San Diego, California, and uh, I went there to get my treatment, and I was up during the whole procedure. I even had a bathroom break, and so it was it was it was really amazing to have brain surgery when you're still awake. <laughs> it was it difficult, to, you know, in terms of cost, having to go to? the United States to get a surgery like this done? It was difficult, yeah, because like I said at the time, um, the Gamma Knife wasn't offered in, in Canada. Uh, the, the health didn't want to pay for my treatment because they wanted me to stay in Canada and get treated here. So I had to lobby for, for uh, funding to go and, and fortunately my First Nation um, helped me out. Do you feel that uh, you know, going through these health scares uh, has influenced the type of music that you do? Um, I don't think it has influenced me and, and the type of music that I have, have been performing because I already started performing it before I got sick and, and uh, I just fell in love with the music and, and um, it, it didn't have an impact on, on my choice of genre. We're speaking with mezzo-soprano Rhonda Head on Face to fo Face. To face. Of course, uh, some success, uh, hard to come without uh, challenges. More on that coming up after this short break. If a story is uncomfortable, would you change it? No, you wouldn't, because there is no power in holding back. 
Stories have the power to change lives, so true storytellers uncover every side, every side of hunger, of families, water, shelter, and health. So we're going to tell your stories every day until issues transform and our communities transform with them. Welcome back to Face to Face, where today our guest is Rhonda Head, the award-winning opera singer from the OCN First Nation in uh, northern Manitoba. Uh, Rhonda, we've discussed some of your uh, health obstacles that you've battled through, and you've come back to uh, perform on, on some of the biggest stages in the world, including Carnegie Hall. Tell us a little bit about how that performance came together. Uh, I sing with the Flin Flon Choir in, uh, in northern Manitoba. And they've always um, uh, welcomed me into their choir. They always invite me when they when they have some exciting gigs coming up, upcoming gigs. Uh, they first invited me to, to perform with them in, at the Lincoln Center in New York City, and that was really exciting. And 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 uh, and then the second time we got to go there again, it was at Carnegie Hall. And Carnegie Hall is probably one of the uh, most amazing venues that I've I've got to to perform in because the acoustics in there are. Are probably one of the best in the world, and and uh, I know a lot of artists strive to to go and perform in there. And I had the chance to sing with with the Glen Flan Community Choir. One of my one of my um, uh, best experiences is, is singing with <coughs> singing with the choir because when you're singing with all these people singing different different uh, notes and different ranges, and then the, the orchestra. It's just an amazing feeling. Like it's it's, it's almost um, like a heavenly experience, and your your energy is being channeled to heaven, and it's really a really beautiful experience. And and that's one of my favorite experiences is singing with the choir. And the Flin Flon Choir is like one of the probably one of the best uh, choirs in in Canada. Like they're so amazing. Was it kind of a surreal experience? Could you ever have imagined that you'd be playing? Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, these types of no, venues. No, it, it's very surreal and really exciting, and and uh, and you know, when I'm singing with the choir, I'm the only Indigenous person on the stage, as well, and that's um, I'm really proud to represent our people that way. What do you think? Uh, how do you think that speaks to uh, you know your own community when they see you and hear that you're going to play in these places? I'm hoping that I'm I'm inspiring them to to uh, to reach goals as well like uh, like you know if I can do it they can do it too like to do whatever dreams they have to follow them and and to reach for them reach for the stars you've recently uh, in the last uh, month re released an album tell us a, a little bit about that I did uh, my CD is called Kisagitin which means uh, I love you in Cree I released it on on Valentine's Day <laughs> to coincide with uh, the name of my CD I wrote a lot of my songs in, uh, at the Banff Center for the Arts at a residency that I attended, and I composed a lot of the music from the landscape of OCN. So I'm really excited and, and uh, I can't wait for people to, to hear it, because it, it's classical music fused with, with uh, some Cree language, and, and I'm really excited about it. You know, classical fused with Cree language, not uh, something that you probably hear too often from people. Is it, has it been uh, difficult to get your music out? Um, it's a little bit difficult uh, because I don't, my, my, my music doesn't fit into the country genre on the radio stations. So my music doesn't really get played that much on, on, the, on the country music stations. But I'm, I'm embraced with, like, with uh, other, other radio stations that don't play too much country music. In terms of getting a, your music out to a, a mass market, uh, have you had any difficulties finding you know, distributors or, or anything for uh, what might be seen as a, a bit of a niche market? I'm, I'm just um, uh, getting into that area right now, so I'm, I'm going to be um, learning what venues and, and uh, the radio station don't want to hear my music. But I have I have been uh, getting requests from uh, radio stations in Arizona and and uh, Albuquerque and some in BC for my music. So um, and they're they're indigenous radio stations. So I think my music they're embracing starting to embrace the the music that I that I have composed. 
You are, uh, your name is often on bills that you see are around town, uh, many fundraisers. How important is it for you to, uh, to give back to the community? It's very important for me. I, I consider myself a humanitarian. Um, I think it's important to give back. Uh, uh, you know, when people are in need, um, they're, they're very vulnerable. And people who can step up and who aren't, who aren't feeling that pain can come up and help them out, like, like the Long Plain fundraiser where they lost, hous they lost housing from the, the tornado. So I stepped up and, and uh, did a fundraiser for them. And uh, it, it's really important for me to give back because, you know, the, the fans give, give, you, give me my, um, my energy and my, my, um, my spirit and my soul. Like they, they, make, they make it rich and for me to give back it is important as well. Do you have uh, youth coming up to you uh, inspired by what you're doing, asking for uh, insp any uh, type of advice that you can give? Yes, they do. Uh, I get a lot of messages on Facebook, and, and uh, mu upcoming musicians ask me how, how you know how to get started and and uh, it, where where to record, where to get lessons, where they, like how did I get where I'm at? So I I, I help them out by um, you know Manitoba Music really helped me out a lot. They have a lot of resources there, so I refer a lot a lot of people, upcoming musicians there. What uh, message do you have for any of those uh, aspiring youth out there looking to get into uh, maybe not just classical but uh, any t type of music? Uh, took you till you were 18 to, to find your voice. I would say um, to follow their heart, to, to follow the music that they really love, whether it's classical, jazz, folk, country, hip hop. Follow the music that they love because their passion will. will will flourish when, when, they're, when they follow the music that they love. Do you see a lot of youth in the communities that you visit, uh, up and coming musicians in your mind? I see a lot of talent in our First Nation communities. Yes, I see lots of them. And, and uh, for, for my advice to them is to keep on performing. Uh, you know, go take music lessons, go take voice lessons, study theory, pr uh, try and uh, hone into your t craft and your technique, whether it's your voice or an instrument, and, and practice. Is it inspiring for yourself to see uh, the amount of youth that uh, are so musically inclined out there? It's very inspiring. That I, I get a lot of inspiration from the youth, from their talent, from their, their passion. Um, yeah, they're very, very inspiring. And, and, and I could just see them flourishing and becoming, you know, becoming stars in the Indigenous community. Rhonda, maybe a little on how uh, people looking to find your music can do so. Um, I'm on iTunes, I'm on CD Baby, and um, uh, I have uh, hard copies of my CDs as well. Has the digital age made it easier for you to get your music out to, yeah, to fans? It, yes, people? it has. Like, all I got to do is um, uh, submit our stuff into CD Baby, and then they'll do all the distributing for you. Rhonda, thank you very much for your time here today on Face to Face. Our thanks to classical singer Rhonda Head for joining us. We've got a look at what's coming up next week after this short break. If a story is uncomfortable, would you change it? No, you wouldn't, because there is no power in holding back. Stories have the power to change lives, so true storytellers uncover every side, every side of hunger, of families, water, shelter, and health. So we're going to tell your stories every day until the issues transform and our communities transform with them. Welcome back to Face to Face. Next week on the show, our guest will be Cora Morgan. Morgan is the First Nations advocate for children in care in Manitoba, a province with roughly 11,000 children in care. About 90% of them are Indigenous youth. Manitoba has the highest rates of apprehension in the country. As many as 40 newborns are being seized each month. Morgan has been an outspoken critic of the child welfare system. Here's a look at some of our conversation. We have the highest apprehension rates in the Western world. 
we have the lowest threshold for apprehension in all of North America. And then Manitoba has 76% uh, of the children on reserve live below the poverty line. We have um, decades of, of theft of children through the residential schools and through the 60s scoop that kind of brought us today. We're fighting against those sorts of things. And then we're looking at, you know, the housing crisis and the, you know, all of the issues of underfunding on reserve that are leading to family breakdowns and those are all the things that we're up against and you know some of those reasons are the things that precipitate um, children coming into the system. The Truth and Reconciliation Commission found there are more Indigenous children being removed from their families today than attended residential school in any one year. Some have referred to the child welfare system as the new residential school system. Is that uh, something that uh, the way you would view it? I, I would view it as that. I mean, it's, it's the loss of identity. It's the theft of children. There's common denominators, but there's different things that are, are slightly different. Well, different, but the same. Um, we've had decades of the residential school. Then we moved to the 60s scoop, and this is more the contemporary view. That's all for today. We're always looking for new guests. So if you have any suggestions, please email us at news at aptn.ca. We leave you tonight with a performance from this week's guest, Rhonda Head. This is Rhonda and the Delbert Anderson Trio with their rendition of the classic song, At Last. Thank you for tuning in to Face to Face. I'm Dennis Warren.